All right. All right, so we left off here. Why do some character traits form a spectrum? To summarize this really quickly, uh, a spectrum or a continuous distribution results from what's called polygenic inheritance. Poly meaning what? Many. Genic meaning genes. And so this is where multiple genes contribute uh, to the phenotype. You get a nice bell-shaped curve. Most individuals having the mean condition, but having some individuals on either extreme. Now, most of these continuously, or uh, most of these phenotypes with continuous variation are highly influenced by environmental factors. And so height is highly uh, influenced by nutrition uh, and some other factors, and um, like exposure to toxins and things like that. And so most of these, if you have multiple genes uh, impacting any particular phenotype, oftentimes the environmental role or the environment plays a large role in what the overall phenotype looks like. You see this a lot with coloration in certain forms, not in, you know, a lot of animals it's fairly simple. Coloration is just presence or absence of particular pigments, but with plants and with some of the insects where you get some more vibrant coloration, you can see more of this continuous variation. Fish are another good example where you have this continuous variation because it's multiple genes influencing these color patterns, and then the environment can play a large role in helping to influence those color patterns. Yeah. So with height, it can be a lack of nutrition and things like that that stunts your growth and causes you to be short of sure. genetically. Yeah. However, it seems like with coloration, it, is it true that the environment affects the actual gene expression? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But how does that work? Um, it, can, it, it depends on the mechanism behind how you deposit that pigment but a lot of it has to do with light intensity yeah light intensity impacting or triggering certain genes to express more because of how intense the light is the more intense the light is the less intense your coloration needs to be in order for it to be demonstrated the less intense the light is the more intense your coloration patterns has to be for it just for you to see it so mostly like the intensity of the color yeah mm -hmm. yeah and not necessarily the color itself all right, so these are referred to as quantitative traits. So human height, uh, coloration in some organisms, uh, even strength, length of certain features. These are quantitative traits. And then each gene in, that contributes to that would be a quantitative trait locus. A, a locus is the site uh, contributing to these quantitative traits. All right, one last question to deal with. And that's this one. Are there genes that impact multiple phenotypes? So here we just talked about where a single phenotype impacted by multiple genes is the opposite true, where you have a single gene influencing multiple phenotypes. And of course, that's going to be true. One of the best examples are pathologies. And so uh, sickle cell anemia is a malfunction in one subunit of hemoglobin. So hemoglobin is a protein with quaternary structure. It has four different polypeptides combined together to form hemoglobin, and a malfunction in one of those four subunits uh, makes it to where the, the red blood cells are significantly worse at carrying oxygen, and they take on a really weird shape because the hemoglobin tend to clump together. They get sickle-shaped, which is why it's called sickle cell anemia, but then that has an enormous number of physiological impacts. But you see, if you can imagine what's going to happen if I can't deliver oxygen as, as well to various tissues, and if I have weird-shaped red blood cells, all of those consequences would be pleiotropic effects of that mutation, of that sickle cell trait. Yeah. So are there genes? Of course. So when a single gene uh, impacts multiple characters, it's, it's said to be pleiotropic. Most of our genetic illnesses are that way. So sickle cell anemia is like cystic fibrosis in that it's, it's a cause. If you have that mutation, you have it. If you don't have that mutation, you don't have it. It's not like you have a higher probability of developing sickle cell anemia if you have a particular mutation. No, it's if you have it, you developed uh, the illness, as long as you've got two copies of it, because it, along with cystic fibrosis, are recessive traits. So you need two copies of that malfunctioning allele. But if you have it, you're going to express that, that genetic illness, and it's going to have pleiotropic effects. So same thing with uh, cystic fibrosis. Its, its main effect is a malfunctioned uh, uh, ion channel, uh, but then it ripples. It has rippling effects all over the body. So that would be another pleiotropic gene. Yeah. So are there any that 
specifically affect multiple things that then ripple out, or is it just one thing that's affected that manifests itself in multiple ways? Um, I, I, I mean, you have conditions for both. So a big, uh, like a main category of pleiotropic genes are master control genes called Hox genes. Mm -hmm. And so Hox genes control, they turn, they're like switches that turn on and turn off other genes during the development of an organism. Mm -hmm. So those are pleiotropic genes because it's a single gene, but then it triggers other genes. And so I think that's what you're getting at. Is it like a gene that triggers other genes that then has an effect, or is it a single gene that produces a single protein that has many physiological impacts? So, two different routes. So it would depend. It would vary from, from pleiotropic gene to pleiotropic gene. But ultimately, the outcome is the same. Mm -hmm. Many phenotypes are impacted. All right? Anything anybody want to share about tw chapter 12 before we move on? I almost combined 12 and chapter and said chapter. <laughs> Okay. All right, so as we prepare for chapter 13, what I want you to do is get into your groups, and I want you to think about, um, so I, as we transition into chapter 13, we're going to talk a lot more about chromosomes, what's going on at the chromosome level, and that's why chapter 13 deals with sex-linked inheritance, because you're talking about different sex chromosomes. Chapter 13 also deals with chromosomal mutations. Okay, so in chapter 13, we're really preparing to just start talking a lot more about chromosomes. But before we get there, I want to make sure you're okay with where we're at chapter 12 chromosomes. Okay, and chapter 12 chromosome discussions have to do with how do the way chromosomes behave explain Mendel's laws, explain the law of segregation, explain the law of independent assortment. So all I want you to do is this. I want you to take, a, um, take an organism... And, and just for simplicity's sake, we're going to say this organism has one pair of chromosomes. Okay? One pair of chromosomes. Okay, one pair of chromosomes. And this chromosome happens to have three genes on it. And just for simplicity's sake, we will call these genes A, B, and C. Okay? And I want you, working with those around you, I want you to come up with what is necessary in order for these genes to assort independently. Okay? So what has to happen using your understanding of chromosomes? What has to happen for these three genes to assort independently when you form gametes? And how can we use those data, the independent assortment, to figure out how far these genes are apart from each other? Okay? Is there any indication from what we've talked about and maybe some underlying thoughts that you've had or things that you've learned that we can not only show what has to happen for these to assort independently but using those data to figure out relatively how far these genes are apart from each other all right take go this is as a group and I'm okay take uh <laughs> take 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 two and a half minutes starting now okay so Yeah. So, what needs to happen in order for these three genes to assort independently? And how can you use the gametes, with our, the, which are the data of what's going on chromosomally? How can you use the gametes to tell relatively how far apart these genes are from each other? Or 
they don't have them together. So it's frequency. Oh, it's A and B always together. So if you have A, you always have B. If you don't have A, then or do you have B by itself? A. What percentage of them? What percentage of the ones that have B have A? These are capital letters. Dominant. So those G's be. I know. I just was dumb. I heard Oh. Yes. And all of them are going to just, I can't that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right. Okay. So, here we have a female. Okay? And this female has two chromosomes. I drew them close together just for simplicity's sake. Plus, I wanted to use this as the same illustration when I go back and say, okay, this represents one individual where they have their paternal and maternal chromosome and sister chromatids. So I'm using, I'm going to get double use out of this illustration. Forgive that, if you will. Okay, so you've got a female, and she has two chromosomes with dominant alleles on both chromosomes for all three loci, right? So she can only make one type of gamete, and that's a gamete that includes the dominant allele for all three loci, right? So she's only going to make one type of gamete, and it's going to look like this. This is the father. He's also can only make one type of gamete, and it's going to look like this. Have the recessive trait for all three characters. Okay? But now when they fuse together, they make this individual, okay? and then these are sister chromatids. So it's, it's preparing for meiosis. Okay? And this is double use out of the same diagram. So this used to be mom, and then now we'll erase this and erase this. And now this is an individual, and we're just showing the maternal chromosome, the paternal chromosome. So when, they, when their gametes fused, this is the situation. And so now we want to know, okay, here's F1, right? And we've got a trihybrid individual. If the genes assort independently, this individual should be able to make how many different gametes? Do you remember this? So a monohybrid individual can make two different types of gametes, right? One with the dominant, one with the recessive. Mm -hmm. A dihybrid individual can make four different types of gametes. Mm -hmm. One with both dominants, one with both recessives, and then one with, you know, dominant for one, recessive for the other, and then the other one's flipped. Mm -hmm. A trihybrid individual can make eight different types of gametes, okay? And so we're going to do these, and this is, if these assort independently, you can make eight different types of gametes. Six, seven, and I'll do my eighth over here. Okay, so we can make eight different types of gametes. Remember, gametes only have a single chromosome and without a sister chromatid. So we can have a gamete that looks like this, right? Looks just like the, the chromosome it got from mom. We can have a gamete that looks like this, which looks just like the chromosome it got from dad. We can have a gamete that looks like this. That's a lowercase c, which looks, well, c probably wasn't my best choice here, because c, uppercase, anyways. I'll do a little star next to the uppercase, just for simplicity. We can do a gamete that looks like this. We can do a gamete that looks like this. We can do a gamete that looks like this. We can do a gamete that looks like this. Let's see. Wait, wait. We can do this, capital A, lowercase b, capital C. Okay, and now, which one am I missing? What am I missing, Alyssa? Oh, I don't know. Lowercase a, capital case b. Yep. Lowercase lower C. C. Yeah. So A, B, and then lowercase C. Thank you, Charles. Mm -hmm. Okay, so these are the eight different gametes that this individual can make if the genes assort independently. Yeah, Alyssa. But they can't because it's, it's not, they can only mix the lowercase and the uppercase if the 
Oh, sure they can. Yeah, so we need to talk about the first part of the question is how does it, how how can they assort independently if they're on the same chromosome, right? So then we need to go. Okay, well these we're like okay these are parental chromosomes. There's no crossing over. This one you had a crossover event basically here. So wouldn't it be a zygote that way? No, because this is the individual. This is the offspring. So this. I, I'm getting dual use out of this diagram, but I'm no longer talking about this is mom with her two chromosomes, this is dad with his two chromosomes. This is child that has two chromosomes, one from mom, one from dad, and each chromosome has a sister chromatid. Right? Yeah, but why two is sister it, chromatids. Why is it haploid then? Well, because their gametes are haploid. All gametes are haploid. So these are the gametes that the offspring are making. Oh, so this is the grandchildren. Well, it's not grandchildren yet, because they would need another gamete to fuse with it to make grandchildren, but this is the fuel to make the grandchildren. Yeah. So this is like the flower, it's not the cake. <laughs> All right, so we can make this one by having a crossover event here, right, to where we, we keep the A and the B together, but now this B takes on this lowercase c, right? And then to generate this one, we have a crossover event here. And so we keep the capital A, but we attach it with lowercase b, lowercase c, right? And that gives us this one, right? Now this one, we just, we, we still have basically that same crossover event that produced this one, also produced this one, because now these two are the lowercase that are going to go with this c. When this c got traded over to here, this c is going to get traded over to here, right? Mm -hmm. And then this one here, now we've got lowercase a, b, and uppercase C, that's this crossover event here, right? The same one that produced this is also going to produce this one right here, because this lowercase a is going to go with this uppercase B and uppercase C. These two are a little bit more interesting, because in order to generate these two, we have capital A, capital C. We actually have to have two crossover events. We have to have this crossover event and this crossover event to generate this chromosome. Right? Does that make sense? Because you've got to get the lowercase b with the a, but then you have to get the uppercase c back. So we call these double recombinants. Both of these, and then this is generated by the same two crossovers. So these are both double recombinants. All right? So that explains how these can... Oh no, I'll work without electronics. Do you need power? Do, you have a... Do I need power? No, I need power. <laughs> power. That's all I have. Why is one light on? What I'm hoping is that every other piece of light is fixed. 30 minutes. All right. So these are our double recombinants. So this is how you facilitate this actually happening. If they're on separate chromosomes, you'd still have the same thing, except for we would just write, is that slowly closing, that door? No. Okay. You would, you, you would just draw each of these genes on separate chromosomes. All right? Now, these double recombinants, these are very rare if these genes are close together. So the second question was, how do you use this to figure out how close these genes are together? Okay. If they're going to sort independently 100% of the time, you're always going to get these recombination events, then 12.5% of your gametes should be this type of gamete, right? 12.5% should be this type of gamete. What about this one? 12.5%. What about this one? 12.5%. And then we just keep going. The other four are all 12.5%. You're like, well, that's cool, because there are eight of them, and eight times 12 and a half is 100, right? Mm -hmm. yes. And so this is if they're sorting independently 100% of the time, which basically tells you that those genes are far enough apart on the chromosome that you're going to get the, 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 them always sorting independently. That's a good indication that those genes are far apart. If, however, you have something like this, so this right here, this scenario where it's 12.5%, this is complete independent assortment. And this tells you that they are far apart. 
If, however, you get something like this, where most of your uh, chromosomes are actually parental, or most of your gametes have parental chromosomes. So let's say 25% have this chromosome, 20, or have the, 25% of the gametes have this chromosome, 25% of the gametes have this chromosome, and then it's 12.5%, 12.5%, 12.5%, 12.5%, and then now this all together, so this is 50. This right here together is 50, right? Right? And then over here we have basically 0%, 0%. This tells us that the genes are not, or the, yeah, the genes are not assorting independently. The characters are not assorting independently, and they, these genes are close together. So part of the time, you can get one of these recombinations to separate the genes and to mix them, but you, they're so close together that you never get a double recombination event. This would be really close together. This would be almost absurd. Usually what you would have is something like 25, 25, maybe 10, 10, 10, 10, and then that would give us another 10%. We'd have 5 and 5, 5 and 5%. Five okay? And then that would be an indication that they're pretty close together. To get zero of your double recombinants, that means these genes are really close together. Really close together. So it's virtually impossible to get a double recombination. All right? And so that's how you would answer that question of what facilitates independent assortment if, in fact, your genes are all on the same chromosome and answers the question of how do you use those data to figure out how far those genes are apart. And so that's basically the first question of the chapter 13 um, PowerPoint. The first question is, how does recombination facilitate independent assortment? That's this right here, showing us how crossing over events helps us to build gametes that are not parental gametes, or gametes that have chromosomes that are not parental chromosomes. Yeah, Joey. Okay, I'm, I'm still not quite seeing the difference between a double recombination versus a single. Okay, so this has capital A, lowercase b, capital C. So yeah. if we did this combination event, it allows us to get the capital A with the lowercase b, right? Uh -huh. And that's what's happening here, capital A with the lowercase b. Uh -huh. But if it does only that recombination, it also has the lowercase c, uh -huh. right? But this one needs the uppercase c. So you'd actually have to do this one and this one to bring that uppercase c back with the lowercase b and now the uppercase a. Couldn't you just swap the b and you get the same result? Right, but the only way, bless, bless you, yeah, but the only way to swap just the B is to do a recombination on either side. Right, the only way you can just send the B over is if you do a recombination on either side of B and just exchange the middle. Wait, it still requires two recombination <laughs> events. Right, because one recombination event is just going to give you whatever's on the rest of the chromosome. Oh, uh, okay. You know? So the only way that would work is if B were at the end. Oh, okay. um, but if you're going to take something out of the middle, you have to have a recombination event on either side. And then here you have the same thing, but now it's the capital B coming over with the lowercase a and c. Yeah, Charles. So how did this not mess up Man Mandel's experiments? Because because all of the characters he used were on separate chromosomes. Oh, so they oh, always right. assorted yes. independently. That's really interesting how that happened. Yeah. He did luck out. Yeah, and that's why didn't, his, his work didn't work on anything else other than pea plants. Every other model organism he tried to use, it didn't work. He wasn't able to confirm his results. And this is why. Yeah. So the first question was this. How does recombination facilitate uh, this independent assortment? And it's by allowing you to get, um, you know, combinations that weren't present, generate chromosomes that, that the parents didn't have. The second question is how do we use a cross like this Right? This would be a, a, like a dihybrid cross, except for this is a trihybrid cross, to map chromosomes. And this is how you answer that question. You basically determine it by the number of recombinant uh, chromosomes. Okay, these are all recombinant chromosomes, these four. Right? You had a recombination event. These are double recombinant. Okay, so this is an even more difficult illustration than what I ask you in your slides which should be an indication to you is probably a more difficult illustration than what you're going to be held responsible for. But if you can manage to think through a trihybrid cross and how you use that to map chromosomes, a dihybrid cross is less complex. Less complex. Less, 
Wow, that was weird how I said that. All right? Does this make sense? Okay. Now, oftentimes, you don't do it in just the gametes because it's easier in most organisms to allow the gametes to fuse, allow reproduction to happen, and then, you know, you, you study the offspring. Because the gametes are a little bit difficult. They're not expressing phenotypes. They're just a cell. Okay? But you could do it with the gametes. All right. I won't keep you all the way until 1240 because, you know, that's, that's, I think, a little extreme considering we don't have power. But I, I, I'm sorry if you were disappointed that I didn't just end class when the power goes out. It's, it's not how I roll. So um, the, the rest of Chapter 13 basically introduces this idea, okay, okay, so we know how we can use chromosomes. We know how we can get independent assortment even if the genes are on the same chromosome. And we know how we can use chromosomes to, or how we can map chromosomes using, you know, recombination frequencies. And then a, a big portion of chapter 13 is then say, okay, well, what happens in our pair of chromosomes that aren't homologous, right? Because human cells have 46 chromosomes, 22 homologous pairs, chromosomes 1 through 22, two copies of each, and then the sex chromosomes. And they're only homologous if you're female for almost all animals, uh, sorry, for, for all mammals, not almost all animals, because it's like mammals and Drosophila, and then that's it. Birds are the exact opposite, and then a lot of animals, their sex is determined by environment. Anyways, so you have, uh, in, 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 in all of your mammals, uh, you have this situation where only the females have 23 homologous pairs. The males have 22 homologous pairs, and then a non-homologous pair. And then so it's like, okay, well then, what happens in those situations? What happens in those situations? And so what you would predict, if, if you think about mammals and the difference between male mammals and female mammals, you would predict that whatever, whatever it is to trigger the development of male exists on the Y chromosome. And that's why if it's present, you get a male mammal, and if it's absent, you get a female mammal. Okay, and that's exactly what you find. There's basically a region on the Y chromosome called the SRY gene, and it's not a single gene. It's, it's kind of a misnomer. They call it the SRY gene, but it's really a region, and it, it leads to a whole suite of developmental changes. So every mammal starts off development as a female. Whether they're male or female, every mammal starts off female until they start to express that SRY region on the Y chromosome, and then you actually resorb the female reproductive tract that's developing and start building up the male reproductive tract. Yeah? So if a person accidentally didn't have their sex gene, would they just have an X that would just be a female? X, yeah, so X not, yes. They'd be a female and they would, need, they would still need hormone therapy, likely, because, and, and they would probably be sterile, because at the point where you go to do meiosis, you, you, it would fail the spindle checkpoint, mm -hmm. because there wouldn't be a chromosome to match up with it. So they would probably be sterile, but for m the most part, they would probably be mostly normal. There are some rare genetic abnormalities. I think that's Turner syndrome. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. that sounds right. Turner syndrome is triple X syndrome. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Tr yeah, three X's is triple X syndrome. Yeah, Josh. When does that switch over to like women having fetus? When do um... like when does that when do you start expressing the the region on the SRY? Yeah. Uh, it's it's pretty early on. I think it's like. Oof. Gosh, I want to say it's like five or like week five or six. I mean, it's early enough that by, by the time you're 10, 11, 12 weeks, you can do a blood test to figure out gender of your offspring. Um, usually you can't tell structurally until like 13, 14 weeks at the earliest, more like 16, 17 uh, weeks. But yeah, as far as that, that shift happens fairly early on. I don't remember the exact time, but I think it's like five, six weeks range. All right. So we will go ahead and call it quits on today. We will finish up this on Friday. Uh, enjoy the rest of your Wednesday.